This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. One of the fundamental principles that we teach children from a very young age is that it's wrong to lie. We teach them this in our homes and we teach it in the classroom. And of course, the Bible teaches this. Colossians 3 and verse 9 says, lie not to one another. Proverbs 12 and verse 22 says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. Now these verses and many others teach that God hates lying. The Bible is very plain about this. And so I'm always surprised when I hear particularly Christians try to defend lying. But unfortunately, it happens quite often. And usually their argument consists of some difficult situation with serious consequences. And the person will suggest that in light of these very undesirable consequences, that lying is the better choice and that God would even approve. And sometimes they'll make appeals to circumstances in the Bible that they believe imply that lying is okay. On one occasion, I had spoken on the subject of lying, and afterwards, uh, one of the members took issue with me over this subject. Particularly, he believed that there are some circumstances in which it's okay to lie, and that you can do so with God's approval. And he became vehement about this subject, and he made arguments to try to prove his point, and he laid out scenarios that he thought would justify lying, and he appealed to passages in the Bible that he thought made his point. Now, what I want to do in this lesson is to cover three points. First, I'm going to discuss some of these scenarios, some of the dilemmas that people put forth to defend lying. Secondly, I'm going to share with you some of the Bible passages that people appeal to to defend lying. And finally, I'm going to give you some arguments that show that it's never right to lie. All right, first, let's talk about some of the situations that people appeal to to try to defend lying. One individual, in an effort to defend lying, told me of a situation in the area in which he lives where someone had been breaking into houses and committing rape. And he put forth a specific circumstance that he said actually took place. And the story went something like this. A grandfather was home alone with his two granddaughters, and he heard something downstairs. And so he told his granddaughters to hide while he went downstairs to investigate. And when he got downstairs, a man knocked him to the ground and put a gun to his head and asked, is there anyone else in the house? Now the man's question to me was this, what would you say? He said, if you tell the truth, it's going to mean tragedy for your granddaughters. And then he proceeded to suggest that under these extreme circumstances, that it would be right to lie. Now what do you say to that? You know, admittedly, this is a terrible situation, and it's one that I hope that I never encounter. But may I suggest to you that a wrong action does not turn into a right one just because the consequences are severe. Sin does not change into not being sin just because of a terrible circumstance. I asked the man this. I said, let's alter the situation a little bit. Let's suggest that the man who broke into the house is a psychopath and he hates Christians. And he says to you, I despise Christians with every bone in my body. Nothing pleases me more than to make a Christian suffer. If you're a Christian, I'm going to make you suffer. Your wife is going to suffer. Your daughters are going to suffer. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And I asked the man, I said, what would you say? He responded and said, I would never lie about my Lord, which is commendable. But I want to know, why not? If it's true, as he argues, that God approves of lying in order to avoid watching your wife and daughter suffer, then why not lie? His response was, that denial would be worse than the consequences. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to appreciate what he has done. He has put himself in a situation where he determines which sins are greatest and which are the least, and then he acts accordingly. In one situation, he believes lying is acceptable. In another, he believes it is not. This is what we call situation ethics, and it's not Bible ethics. You know, Abraham tried to pull a stunt like this one time to protect life, his own life, and the method he used was lying. In Genesis 20, Abraham lied to Abimelech about Sarah being his sister. Now, the reason he gave in verse 11 is, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me, on account of my wife. But you know, despite the fact that he lied to protect his own life, it's clear in this chapter that he was wrong for so doing. 
Now, another scenario that was posed to me on one occasion was this. Someone said, if lying is wrong, then that would mean that the government cannot lie. And if the government cannot lie, then that puts our spies and our intelligence programs in very serious jeopardy. Now, it's true that many governments lie. Now, I know that may be a shock to you, but governments sometimes lie and sometimes convince themselves that it's necessary to do so. But the Bible still says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Matthew 5, 37. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, if a government lies, it doesn't make it right just because it's the government. In fact, the Bible says it's a reproach upon that nation. And again, the consequences of a sin do not somehow transform it into being a non-sin. I read a quote by an unknown author that said this, Always tell the truth, and if you can't always tell the truth, don't lie. You know, sometimes in difficult situations, the best thing to do is to say nothing. Now, in this same context, someone even suggested to me that the truth is so precious that sometimes it has to be protected by a bodyguard of lies. Friends, that is absolute nonsense. That is the devil's handiwork. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, 23. Don't ever be one of those people who gives up holding on to the truth. There is nothing so precious upon this earth that we should cease to walk in the paths of truth and to walk down the pathway of the devil. You know, sometimes men will even argue that mercy overrides truth, that mercy is greater than truth, and that being the case, there are times that we must lie in order to uphold mercy. But you know, that makes me wonder, if lying is justified by mercy, are there other sins that are justified by mercy? Could adultery somehow be justified by mercy? Could homosexuality be justified by mercy? Could abortion be justified by mercy? Could we indeed have such a thing as mercy killings? But you know, God is a God known for His mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 says that He is rich in mercy, and yet Titus 1 and verse 2 says He cannot lie. The two are not mutually exclusive, and they do not contradict each other. And consider this. Certainly no one would ever question the wonderful mercy of Jesus Christ. Titus 1 and verse 4, Jude and verse 21, and yet I never read about Jesus lying. Now, was it the case that we are faced with moral dilemmas that would demand that we choose the lesser of two evils, and yet the Lord never was? And if He never was, what about Hebrews 4 and verse 15 that says He was tempted in all points like as we are? Ladies and gentlemen, when the Lord walked this earth, He was the perfect example for us to emulate. And we can concoct all the scenarios we want to, but let's ask, what would the Lord do if He were in these dilemmas? I know He wouldn't lie. Now, why do I say that? Because if He did, at that moment, He would cease to be God. Because Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 says, God cannot lie. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, John 14, 6. Now, for our second point, let's discuss some of the Bible arguments that people make in an effort to defend lying. The most common argument that I ever hear is an appeal to the story of Rahab. On one occasion, someone posed it to me this way. They said, when the spies entered the promised land to spy out the land, what would have happened if Rahab had not lied to protect them? How would the children of Israel have received the promised land? Well, of course, the answer is God would have done it some other way. Romans 8, 28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God. Now, that passage teaches us that regardless of what men may do to us or what may happen to us, God can use it to accomplish His will. God's plan was not dependent upon Rahab. He would have accomplished it whether she lied or not. Well, sometimes it's argued this way. When the spies came to Rahab, she lied to protect them. Later, she is blessed for her actions, and therefore we have a situation where a lie is met with God's approval. And so it was a justified lie. Well, I want to read it. Let's look at this particular passage, Joshua 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went, and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. Then she took the two men and hid them. 
So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now, when you read this account, it's clear that Rahab did lie. In fact, she tells several lies. Verse 4, she says, I did not know where they were from. Verse 5, when it was dark, the men went out. Also in verse 5, where the men went, I do not know. Now, these are clearly lies. But the problem seems to arise when we get to the New Testament and we see that Rahab is actually complimented by God for her behavior. And so some people think that they find sanction for lying. So let's look at the two passages in the New Testament that mention Rahab. The first one is Hebrews 11 and verse 31. The text says, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Now, where does that passage condone lying? It doesn't. She simply is complimented for receiving the spies with peace. Now, the second passage, James 2 and verse 25 says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Now again, this passage does not condone her lying. One person tried to argue from this passage that lying was an inherent part of sending them out another way. But I want you to appreciate with me that this passage can stand wholly and separately apart from the lie. Let's assume that it took place this way. The king's men came to the house, they knocked on the door, and they asked Rahab, can we come in and look around? And she said, sure. And they walked around and they found nothing and they left. Could the scriptures have still complimented her for receiving them and sending them out another way? Yes. The statement is not dependent upon the lie. Rahab's lie is never condoned in the scriptures. This story about Rahab merely provides an example of where God honored a woman due to her obedient faith in spite of a character flaw. In, in fact, in spite of a lot of character flaws. At this time, she's a heathen, she's a harlot, and she's a liar. But she tried to help God's people, and God thus blesses her in spite of character flaws, not because of them. Well, another passage that people sometimes appeal to to try to justify lying is Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. This is the account of the Hebrew midwives. Now, I want to read it, and then we'll discuss it. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that He provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Now, the argument goes like this. Pharaoh commanded the midwives to kill the newborn male Hebrews. The midwives disobeyed the decree. The midwives lied when questioned concerning their actions. And then God blessed the midwives. Now, since God blessed the action of which a lie was a part, then He must have sanctioned a lie. But that is not what the Bible says. The text says that God blessed them because they feared Him, not because they lied. And as a matter of fact, verse 17 indicates that the way they exhibited their fear of God was by sparing the babies. And that was prior to the lie even taking place. I would say it this way. They spared the babies because they feared God. They lied because they feared Pharaoh. There's no justification for lying in this passage. Now, another Bible passage where people will sometimes seek justification for lying is 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 and 2. 
In this chapter, God has rejected Saul from being the king and has instructed the prophet Samuel to go and anoint a new king from among the sons of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now Samuel's concerned about this because he asked, what if King Saul hears about this? He'll kill me. And so in verse 2 the Bible says, And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And so the argument suggests that God actually told Samuel to lie in order to protect himself from Saul. But the fact is, it wasn't a lie at all. We see as we continue through the chapter that what God instructed Samuel to do was to arrange a sacrifice in Bethlehem and to invite the family of Jesse to the sacrifice. And on that occasion of the sacrifice, God would reveal to Samuel which one was to be the next king, and he would anoint him there. It wasn't a lie at all. Well, someone even argued to me that the wise men in Matthew chapter 2 lied by not returning to Herod after they saw the baby Jesus. I want you to listen to what Matthew 2 and verse 7 says. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. Now, unless I'm missing something, there is nothing said here about a promise to return. And besides that, in verse 12, God told them to go a different way. There is certainly no justification for lying in this verse. Now, I want to spend a few minutes and examine some arguments that will show you that lying is always wrong. Now, some of these we've already alluded to, but I want to put them together here in a neat package. Argument number one to prove that lying is always wrong is this. Right and wrong are not determined by earthly consequences. You know, sometimes doing right is very costly. Jesus told the rich young ruler that doing right would cost him all that he had. Doing right cost the Apostle Paul beatings and abuse. You know, when we begin to determine right and wrong based upon the earthly consequences, we're really going to get out of whack spiritually. 1 John 3 and verse 4 says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law for sin is the transgression of the law. That's how I determine right and wrong. It is, does it transgress God's law, not the earthly consequences. Argument number two to prove that lying is always wrong comes from Revelation 2 and verse 10. It says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now this passage was written to Christians who were suffering persecution. In the beginning of verse 10, the Bible discusses the fact that they were going to suffer. Some of them would be thrown into prison. They would suffer tribulation. And it's in this context that the Lord says, Be faithful unto death. Homer Haley in his commentary on Revelation phrased it this way, Even to the point of dying. Now what's the Lord saying? He is saying, Be faithful and do right, even if it costs you your life. Now what does that have to do with these scenarios where people suggest that you have to lie to protect your life? It destroys them. Friends, the truth is more precious than life itself. God is the God of truth, Psalm 31.5, and I always want to be like Him. I remember that Jesus said, Fear not Him who can destroy the body, but rather fear Him who can destroy both the body and soul in hell, Matthew 10, 28. What is Jesus saying except, don't be afraid of physical death, be afraid of sinning and losing your soul. Now, consider this third proof that lying is always wrong. Revelation 21, 8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I want you to notice that it doesn't say some liars. It doesn't say all liars except those who were put in really tough situations. It doesn't say all except those who lied to protect human life. Friends, it just says all. Now that's the passage I'm holding to. People can come up with all of the scenarios they want to, but what they really need is a passage of Scripture where God says it's all right to lie, and there's not one. Proof number four. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 says God cannot lie. Now I have to wonder, if lying is sometimes okay, then why can God not do it ever? Why did Jesus never do it? And if mercy justifies lying, 
Why can't the God of mercy lie? Folks, the answer is lying is always wrong. It's inherently evil, and that's why God cannot do it. Number five, would you consider that the Bible says that Satan is the source of lying? John 8, 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. When the devil tells a lie, he speaks from his own resources, the Bible says. Matthew 5.37 again says, Let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And so when I lie, my father is the devil. He's the source of the lie. They are from the evil one. Now for a person to suggest that it's sometimes all right to lie is to suggest that it's sometimes all right to stop following God and to follow the devil. Now this conclusion I reject with every ounce of my being. It is not biblical. Argument number six to prove that lying is always wrong is this. God will provide a way of escape. It was suggested to me by someone who was trying to defend lying that sometimes you have to choose the lesser of two evils. You know, I remember in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 that the Bible says, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Ladies and gentlemen, I can trust that God's way of escape from sin is not going to be another sin. There will always be a path that I can choose which does not involve violating His will. Now, I may not always choose to take it, but it will be there nonetheless. You know, the more I study this, the more I am convinced that this is a very serious error for a Christian to hold that lying can sometimes be right. It's a misunderstanding of God Himself. Proverbs 6.17 says, God hates a lying tongue. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. Psalm 31, 5 calls God the God of truth. The psalmist wrote, For the word of the Lord is right, and all of His works are done in truth. Psalm 33, 4. Leviticus 19, 11 says, You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie to one another. Proverbs 13, 5, A righteous man hates lying. Friends, lying is always wrong.